And the persistence of mouth breathing, and Bill talked about that, Bill Hang, post-tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy plays a pro role in progressive worsening of the AHI index. He said it may not happen for six months, but it can frequently happen within three years. Now my daughter, I brought her, because of course she has the same genetics as me. From day one she had a high palate. She's missing two incisors, which was revealed with scans. Um, and she was displaying some symptoms of oral breathing, mouth breathing. I said, oh my God, it's happening in front of me. What am I going to do? So I went and we had tonsillectomy, we had adenoidectomy, we had lip tied on, we had tongue tied on. But the ENT never told us to breathe through the nose. And I sent on the papers to him afterwards. Because even though it's been published, the awareness of it, this is a 2015 paper as far as I can remember, the awareness of it hasn't got out there. And the treatment of pediatric obstructive sleep apnea and sleep disorder breathing, it means restoration of the continuous nasal breathing during wakefulness and sleep. Now we have to note, he didn't just say sleep. It's not just enough to get the mouth closed during sleep, we also need to get the mouth closed during the day. How you breathe during the day is going to influence how you breathe during your sleep. And as I said earlier, my daughter is missing two incisors, but if teeth are missing, missing or absent or extracted early on in life, this can lead to bone retraction and affect the facial growth. You all know this. 257 people aged 14 to 30 years, they had extraction of wisdom teeth. The patients had flow limitation between 50 to 90 percent of total sleep time and a median apnea hypopnea index of seven and a half events per hour. So if teeth are missing, of distraction of wisdom teeth, it's showing a risk with obstructive sleep apnea. Tetogenesis, 41 subjects, flow limitation for more than 50%, a mean apnea hypopnea index of 7.3. And tetogenesis is a common disorder, and it seems to be increasing, and nobody knows why. It seems to be linked maybe environment, epigenetics, but it's affecting 10 to 20 percent of the studied population. There's a genetic component to it. It's common to have one tooth missing, but 10 percent of cases will have two teeth missing. And in our, teeth re in our children recognized with sleep disorder breathing, they had at least two missing teeth. But if you go back as infants, they were crying labeled as having colic, sleep disruption, difficulty feeding a malam potty score of three to four. In other words, they had very little space in the oral pharynx. A high narrow palate associated with a narrow maxilla. Again, the same features that you're so familiar with. When we were, when we were in Bordeaux, Christian Guimano gave us a talk and he, he said, I quote, we should look for whether teeth are missing early on in a child's life. This should be seen as early as possible. There's no doubt there are simple ways of seeing a lack of dental development and this could be seen way before the sleep disorder breathing occurs. He said he talks of some of his patients coming in with OSA at the age of 40 but they were missing teeth. He said this could have been predicted when they were children. I predicted with my daughter, she's six years of age and we are doing expansion with her to make room in her jaws, to put implants to ensure that she doesn't have a life that I had. But I'm lucky. If I didn't have the information I have, she would have fell between the cracks. She would have been overlooked. Some of these people, as I said, were recognized with OSA at 40, and it should have been missing earlier on. If there's missing teeth, there's abnormal growth of the face and secondary decrease of the size of the upper airway. Prematurity. 400 premature infants, 292 indicated progressive development of obstructive breathing during sleep. It's very high, almost three quarters. Full-term children are also at risk, especially if mouth breathing. 2015 paper. <clears throat> so, some muscle activity, and I think this is really interesting, and you know, we did touch on it. Somebody spoke about having short frenulums. If there's a short anterior frenulum leading to abnormal feeding behavior and speech development, 
All children in the study with an untreated short frenulum had sleep disorder breathing. All had narrow palate. It's 100%. Short frenulum is again, in Ireland, it was something that is not looked at. On the Irish Health Board website, it says it affects between 3 and 10% of the infant population. In other words, they haven't got a clue. And as it's not looked at, it's not considered in terms of the effect of short frenulum and feeding. If an infant has a short frenulum, they have difficulty feeding because they can't extrapolate milk from the breast. And breastfeeding is not just for nutrition. Breastfeeding is to allow the child to develop the muscles of the face to ensure good muscle tone. Nasal breathing starts from day one. But if the frenulum is tight, the baby is clamping on the mother, the mother is in pain, the baby is in thriving, and the milk bottle is introduced. But it's so easy to drink milk from the bottle, the baby isn't going to go back on the breast where it requires work. And probably that's the first step where it all goes wrong. Rhinitis then is probably the second step. Rhinitis is nasal obstruction, runny nose, and it affects generally about 30% of the population. But frenulum is easy to deal with. I was afraid of my life to get my daughter's frenulum cut. I knew about it, but I was afraid of it. I did it when she was four, I think four or five years of age. But we still caught it fairly early on. So a short frenulum is something to look for.